if we could talk about maybe experimental validation and yes. uh, you, you're the co-author of a recently published book, Proving Einstein Right. The, the human story of it too, the daring expeditions that change how we look at the universe. Do you see echoes of the early days of general relativity in the 1910s to the more stretched out to string theory? I do, out of I do. And that's one reason why I was happy to focus on, uh, on the story of how Einstein became a global superstar. Um, Earlier in our discussion, we went over the, 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 his history where in 1915 he, he came up with this piece of mathematics, used it to do some calculations, and then made a prediction. Yes. But making a prediction is not enough. Someone's got to go out and measure. And so string theory is in that in-between zone. Now for Einstein, it was from 1915 to 1919. 1915, he makes the, uh, makes the correct prediction. By the way, he made an incorrect prediction about the same thing in 1911, but he corrected himself in 1915. And by 1919, the first pieces of experimental observational data became available to say, yes, he's not wrong. And by 1922, the the argument that based on observation was overwhelming that he was not wrong. Can you describe what special and general relativity are just briefly sure. in sense and what prediction Einstein made and maybe <laughs> maybe some or a memorable moment from the the human journey of trying to prove this thing right, sure. which is incredible. Right. So I'm very fortunate to have worked with a, a, a talented novelist who wanted to write a book that coincided with a book I wanted to write about w how science kind of feels if you're a person. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's actually people who do science, even right. though that may not be obvious to everyone. Uh, so for me, I wanted to write this book for a couple of reasons. I wanted young people to understand that the seeming alien giants that live before them were just as human as they are. They get married, they get divorced. They get married, they get they divorced. Get... They do terrible things, they do great things. They're people, they're just yeah. people like you. And so that part of telling the story allowed me to get that out there for both young people interested in the sciences as well as the public. Yeah. But the other part of the story is I wanted to open up sort of what, what it was like. Now, I'm a scientist, and so I will not pretend to be a great writer. I understand a lot about mathematics, and I've even created my own mathematics that, you know, is kind of a weird thing to be able to do. But in order to tell the story, you really have to have uh, an incredible uh, master of the narrative. And my, that was my co-author, Kathy Pelletier, who is a novelist. We, so we formed this conjoined brain, I used to call us. <laughs> She used to call us Professor Higgins and Eliza Doolittle. My expression for us is that we were a conjoined <laughs> brain to tell this story. And it allowed, uh, so what are some magical moments? To me, the first magical moment in telling the story was looking at Albert Einstein in his struggle. Because although we regard him as a genius, as I said, in 1911, he actually made an incorrect prediction about bending starlight. And that's actually what set the astronomers off. In 1914, there was an eclipse. And by various accidents of war and weather and all sorts of things that we talk about in the book, no one was able to make the measurement. If they had made the measurement, it would have disagreed with his 1911 prediction because nature only has one answer. Mm -hmm. And so you then you see how fortunate he was that wars and bad weather and accidents and transporting equipment stopped any measurements from being made. So he corrects himself in 1915, and but the astronomers are already out there trying to make the measurement. So now he gives them a different number, and it turns out that's the number that nature agrees with. So it gives you a sense of this is a person struggling with something deeply. And it, although uh, his deep insight led him to this, it is the circumstance of time, place, and accident 
but through which we view him. And it could, the story could have turned out very differently, where first he makes a prediction, the measurements are made in 1914, they disagree with his prediction, and so what would the world view him as? Well, he's this professor who made this prediction that didn't get it right. Yes? So the fragility of human history is illustrated by that story, and it's one of my favorite things. He also learned things like uh, in our book, the, how eclipses and watching eclipses was a driver of the development of science in our nation when it was very young. In fact, even before we were a nation, it turns out uh, there were uh, citizens of citizens of this uh, would-be country that were going out trying to measure eclipses. So some fortune, some misfortune affects the progress of science. Absolutely. Especially with ideas as, uh, to me at least, if I put myself back in those days, as radical as general relativity is. First, can you describe, uh, if it's okay, briefly, what general relativity is? And yeah, if, if could you just take a moment of, yeah, put yourself in those shoes uh, in the ac in academic researchers, scientists of that time, and what is this theory? What is it trying to describe about our world? It's trying to answer the thing that left Isaac Newton puzzled. Isaac Newton says gravity magically goes from one place to another. He doesn't believe it, by the way. He knows right. that's not right. But the mathematics is so good that you have to say, well, I'll throw my qualms away because I'll use it. That's all we used to get for, uh, a man from the Earth to the Moon was that mathematics. So I'm one of those scientists, and I've seen this. And if I thought deeply about it, maybe I know that Newton himself wasn't comfortable. And so the first thing I would hope that I would feel is, gee, there's this young kid out there who has an idea to fill in this hole that was lay, left with us by Sir Isaac Newton. That would, I hope, would be my reaction. I have a suspicion. I'm, I'm kind of a mathematical creature. Mm -hmm. uh, I was four years old when I first decided that science was what I wanted to do with my life. And so if my personality back then was like it is now, uh, I think it's probably likely I would want to wanted to have studied his mathematics. What was a piece of mathematics that he was using to make this prediction? Because he didn't actually create that mathematics. That mathematics was created roughly 50 years before he lived. He's the person who harnessed it in order to make a prediction. In fact, he had to be taught this mathematics by a friend. Mm -hmm. So this is in our book. So putting myself in that time, I would want to, like I said, I think I would feel excitement. I would want to know what the mathematics is, and then I would want to do the calculations myself. Because one thing that physics is all about is that you don't have to take anybody's word for anything. It's You can do it yourself. It does seem that mathematics is a little bit more tolerant of radical ideas or mathematicians or people who uh, find beauty in mathematics. Why, all the white questions have no good answer, but let me ask, why do you think Einstein never got the Nobel Prize for general relativity? He got it for the photoelectric effect. That is correct. Well, the, first of all, the, that's something that is misunderstood about the Nobel Prize in physics. The Nobel Prize in physics is never given for purely giving, uh, for purely proposing an idea. It is always given for proposing an idea that has observational support. So he could not get the Nobel Prize for either special relativity nor general relativity because the provisions that Alfred Nobel left for the award prevent that. Uh, but after it's been validated, can he not get it then or no? Yes, but remember the validation doesn't really come until the 1920s. Yeah, but that's why they invented the second Nobel Prize. I mean, uh, Marie Curie, you can get a second Nobel Prize for one of the greatest so, so let theories me, in physics. So right? let me, let's be clear on this. The theory of general relativity had its critics even up until the 50s. So if you had, if we had, if the committee had wanted to give the prize for general relativity. There were vociferous critics of general relativity up until the 50s. Einstein died in 1955. Yeah. 
what what lessons do you draw from from the story you tell in the book, from general relativity, from the radical nature of the theory, to, to looking at the future of string theory? Well, I think that the string theorists are probably going to retrace this path, but it's going to be far longer and more torturous, in my opinion. Uh, string theory uh, is such a, a, a broad and deep development that, in my opinion, when it becomes acceptable, it's going to be because of a confluence of observations. It's not going to be a single observation. And I have to tell you that, um, so I gave a seminar here yesterday to my team, and it's it's on an idea I have about how string theory can leave signatures uh, in the cosmic microwave background, which is an astrophysical structure. And so if those kinds of observations are borne out, uh, if perhaps uh, other things related to the idea of supersymmetry are borne out, those are going to be the first powerful observationally-based pieces of evidence that will begin to do what the Eddington expedition did in 1919. But who that may take several decades. Do you think there will be Nobel Prizes given for string theory? No. Because... Because decades. I think the uh, because I, it'll be it'll be I think it will exceed normal human lifetimes. But there are other prizes that are given. I mean, there is something called the uh, Breakthrough Prize. Um, there's a Russian immigrant, a Russian American immigrant named Yuri Milner, I believe his name, started this wonderful prize uh, called the Breakthrough Prize. It's three times as much money as the Nobel Prize, and it gets awarded every year. And so something like one of those prizes is likely to be garnered at some point far earlier than a Nobel award.